thank you so much for coming. Um, some of you may not know, but the reason that we are all here is because Josh Spector put together this organization called Badass Marketers and Founders. And um, it's, it started as a Facebook group online that now is 13,000 people strong. Wow. And yeah, so Josh um, was hosting events like this twice a month. And he recently moved down to LA, and I'm taking over the San Francisco portion of this group, so I will now be hosting these events twice a month. My goal is to find the most incredible, awesome, inspiring speakers to bring here. My goal is also to kind of make it a little bit more fun um, and bring you to some badass venues like this one. Um, so yeah, and then and then recently Facebook actually made it possible for me to create subgroups within a group. So I created a San Francisco subgroup of this group, and if you're not already in it, I would love for you to join. Um, just request on Facebook, and and we can connect there. The goal is to just expand this community and, and share our knowledge. I think as marketers and founders and entrepreneurs and hustlers, we're all you know trying to educate ourselves as fast as we can about this extremely fast-changing community. And, and, and there's new tools all the time. There's new strategies. And we're just trying to share our knowledge, right? And, and I want to try and build a community with you guys. We're all here. We're all standing in line at fields. We're all sitting in chariots or taking BART and like let's all meet each other, let's share what we're learning um, and that's what this is kind of all about. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our guest for today. She is, um, her name is Christina Wallander. She, she spent six years working at Amazon, which is one of the largest companies in the world and then she dove head first into a startup at Ticketfly. Um, and she helped to build Ticketfly into something that was kind of like a semi-disorganized startup into something that was, became worth $450 million when Amazon, when uh, Pandora went and acquired them. So um, she did that with a team of awesome marketers at, at Ticketfly. And um, now I'm super lucky to have her as our new fearless marketing leader at Realty Shares, which is where I work, um, and she joined us very recently. So um, let's give a round of applause for Christina. So um, Christina and I have had a really, really busy week slash day. <laughs> Um, before this, I think I gave like the largest presentation of my whole career to like every executive in our company. She crushed it. <laughs> totally crushed at, it. At four o'clock today, and then it ended at five, and then I ran here, <laughs> and we're doing this. And then Christina, you were not feeling very well um, for the past week or two. Oh yeah. So I thought I had a cold, and turns out that I had pneumonia. Um, which I guess uh, prior to learning that I had pneumonia, I thought that was like a like I mean I believe it is for certain people like threatening for me. Uh, fortunately, it's not. Uh, but anyway, so yeah. So it turns out it's a little fluid in your lungs, and with antibiotics it goes away. But there's a lot of coughing. So thank you for saying that. Excuse me, and I'm still on the tail end. Not of it. contagious. We we have all the oh, right. Also not contagious. That's an important thing to know. Yes. And the germs that got me sick could have gotten others sick, but my own germs uh, hopefully uh, will not get you <laughs> so um, I'm glad we covered that important topic first but um, yes yeah, so I think everyone's probably wondering you know who you are and how you how you got into marketing so let's let's kick it off with that yeah well maybe I'll, I'll just start by saying one thing about the badass marketers and founders because I actually learned about it through Kaylee and I just think it's so great that this community exists and then we have a space like this to come together and learn from one another. And so I just wanted to echo my thanks to Josh and to you for grabbing the baton and helping us deepen our connections here in San Francisco. Because Josh moved to LA and with that, there was sort of a what's gonna happen. And what's happening is that we are now under Achilles' great leadership. So, um, so anyway, so how I got into marketing. Um, what kind of, I guess I'd, I'd always been interested in sort of the hidden factors that influence human behavior. Uh, especially the things that at first glance don't seem rational. So as an undergrad, I was doing a lot of research on behavioral economics and thesis, but like I didn't really know how to apply that to a career. So uh, out of college, I did some banking and financing things. 
um, at JP Morgan. And uh, so I think, you know, perhaps a lot of folks in this room have had the experience of meeting someone who irreversibly changes the trajectory of your life and your career. Uh, and so for me, one of those people is a woman named Jennifer Ocker. Uh, she was one of my business school professors, and uh, she taught a class on branding. And I guess before the class, I'd always thought that a brand was kind of like a logo and some colors and, you know, all sort of packaged up in a nice way, and I knew that they were important things. But, um, but what I learned is that a brand is how you make people feel. And, uh, you know, I think as a company, you know, you can't control how people feel. If you've ever tried to do that, you probably know it, it doesn't go over very well. Um, but you influence that through absolutely everything you do, literally everything. What your website looks like, the information it does or does not have, how you answer the phone, the products you do or do not build. All of it is part of your brand. And brands have value is the other piece. And so I guess as a behavioral economist, I was like, huh, at first, like, why would someone pay more for a branded product than a generic alternative that's effectively the same thing, but it's not the same thing because the brands we associate with are part of our identity. Like people, parents who buy Clorox bleach feel good about making the best choices for their household. And at like a deeper psychological level, that makes them feel better. And I wanted to be a part of creating that. So that's how I got into it. I love how you, the psychology of it. So I studied psychology in college and I'm also super fascinated by it. So I think just like the, the language that you choose and how it makes people feel is also what makes me excited about marketing and and what makes it fun for me. Yeah, I think like, like, I guess at some deeper level, I feel like when we do great work as marketers, people feel better, like at the end of the day, and being a part of that is just like, that's really special, so. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. So, so you felt passionate about branding. Passionate about branding, yes. So, and that sort of led me into more of a marketing track in my career. Got it, okay, so, so the first big, giant, huge, enormous stop you had was Amazon. And Amazon is, as we know, a super structured, process-oriented, intense place to work, as you've explained to me in the past. So they've managed to build this kind of customer loyalty and um, customer-centric company. Can you tell us a little bit about like what their secret sauce is? Yeah, I think so. How I found myself, so Post Business School Amazon was my first stop, and um, I guess why I joined is I wanted to be a part of Earth's most customer centric company. And uh, it was a, definitely an incredible period of learning. Um, it also, as my favorite manager said, a, a great Darwinian struggle for survival. Um, has anyone here in the crowd worked for Amazon? Okay, all right, so, then you guys are not uh, yet, or perhaps maybe you've heard about the Jeff Bezos question mark. So there is no better definition of customer centricity than the Jeff Bezos question mark. So I'll explain to you what it means. So effectively, there are these daily flash reports that are automated and sent out to all of Amazon's leadership with the most important metrics that everyone needs to be monitoring at all times. And um, if Jeff Bezos sees something that he does not like in the metrics, he sort of pulls out that section of the report and forwards it to uh, the head of the category uh, with nothing but a question mark, with literally no additional text. I mean, this is he's so utterly disappointed that he cannot muster words. <laughs> so that gets forwarded from the category leader effectively onto the person who is, you know, basically responsible for writing that metric. Right? And, um, you know, I think like all of us have probably received emails from execs and usually, you know, you write a thoughtful response and, and you're done. Uh, but at Amazon, you are not done. You are, uh, you know, held accountable uh, for in a very short period of time, uh, you know, diving deep into exactly the root cause of the problematic metric and coming up with an action plan to ensure that there is a near immediate turnaround. So one of the jobs I had at Amazon, I was in uh, operations and movies category, and that was where I received my first Jeff Bezos question mark. Uh, so I'll remember forever, it was an Amazon cord, which I'll explain in a second. Uh, for the Gilmore Girls Complete Series. So disc number 24 in a 42 disc set was defective. And uh, so Amazon Port is actually a cool program. So it's borrowed from Toyota Production Systems. And 
at Toyota, um, if you're on the manufacturing line, and you see the same defect twice pass by you, there's actually a physical cord you can pull to stop the line. So we can go back and take a look at, you know, whether there's some root cause that's pumping out of the back of units and stop more from being produced. So at Amazon, any Amazon cord is pulled. If the same customer receives, essentially has the same problem twice. So they purchase a product, it has a defect, or something's wrong with it. They return it, get a free replacement, and that free replacement has the exact same defect. So that's called an anode. And the equivalent of pulling the cord is that the buy box is removed from the detail page so that no other customers can purchase a product that could potentially be defective. So this obviously results in lost revenue and it's problematic. Um, so anyway, uh, so I dug into the um, briefing I got for. So all of our stock had just number 24, uh, and um, was responsible for a plan to fix that. I could like go into the details around that, but it was suffice it to say that um, it you know re resulted in cleaning our inventory and also uh, the very you know insist on the highest standards, customer centric solution, which was to work with Warner to manufacture 7,000 disc number 24 so to proactively ship them to all of the customers who had purchased this series because many of them had not yet gotten to this 24. So how do you feel about Gilmore Girls? <laughs> yeah, so it's funny because I actually forgot what was happening in Lorelai and Rory's life at the time of, you know, this 24 within the full series, but it actually, prior to this incident, had been one of my favorite shows in college and I think I do it a little differently. Um, it came back around, by the way, if anyone is on Netflix, so there's a few uh, new episodes to kind of close out the story, but, um, but I guess, yeah. So, so the secret sauce. So the secret sauce is having, having the founder be, like, have an eye on every piece of metric that goes through the company, even if it's as tiny as a Gilmore Girl, Disc 24, that's a right. defect. <laughs> so our CEO, a man at the time who was responsible for a $60 billion company, was sending an email about a product that by our own sales ranking algorithm was not that popular. Like we only sold 6,000 units by that point in time. Like DVDs, this is like, you know, the second largest category at Amazon at the time. And there's like a lot of other priorities as you can imagine. I mean, this is where it, it boils down to the kind of person who, can work in an environment where actually you can imagine if you're like putting supply chain for DVDs, like I had, you know, sort of a big job and a lot of responsibility, and the number of hours of sleep that I lost over just 24. But the thing is, because you a whole customer obsession is like obsession is like a religion. So, like doing the right thing for the customer, like we got a lot of good stuff. We created a program to proactively work with the studios in the event of a, you know, a few discs defective and a multi-disc set in the future. So we set up a, you know, sort of a solve like going forward, and that is a better customer experience, and it's holding that high standard and everyone top to bottom understands what that means and is accountable. I think there's two things here. It's like, first of all, measuring, being able to have the tracking and measurement in place to, to, to be able to identify that there is, you know, one disc missing in this set or really just like being able to measure absolutely everything in your business so that you can identify what's working and what's not. And then the other thing is like care, having a founder and people that, that care deeply enough about the littlest things about customer experience, right? Because we want the most perfect customer experience for everyone. Yeah, like you, Amazon wasn't like the metrics we were looking at, like we can see revenue, but the mantra was focused on the inputs. Like revenue is an output. Like revenue is a matter of having the greatest selection, having the lowest prices, having your products in stock when customers come to detail pages, having a great customer experience. And so we looked at things like contacts per thousand units ordered and uh, this term called fast track, which is like the percent of time that cu customer comes to a product detail page and they can receive a product, you know, in the, with the prime shipping two day uh, shipping window. But the things that people are measuring on aren't revenue. They're, they're the inputs that drive revenue. So it's measuring, I guess, like holding yourselves accountable to the right metrics. Yeah. Yeah. So I think for, for a lot of us, we, I've never worked at a company as large as Amazon. I've only worked in the startup world. A lot of these people, I think, are probably working in, in startups as marketers or some, some of bigger companies. And you've kind of had the opportunity to work at this enormous company that, you know, tracks everything and has everything running really smoothly, right? And then you, you kind of went from there and you went to a startup, right? So how many people would take a fly when you joined? About 100. Okay. So um, tell us about kind of that 
that transition from like an enormous structured company to to a startup? What was that like, and like what did you take with you from Amazon and kind of implement as they apply? Yeah, that it was definitely uh, it was. It was, there was a bit of whiplash because it was very different. And I guess like I realized how much I had taken for granted. <laughs> how much like of the sort of, you know, I don't really work for big companies anymore in Chase, Amazon, Forest, like, these are big, big businesses that kind of have like a lot of these policies and process and automation in place and then came to a place that was still building all of that. And so a lot of my observations about ticket flying in the early days, I think were really more observations about a company at that stage of its life cycle. Um, but I certainly brought things from Amazon, although I'll say that I learned things at Ticketfly I never would have learned at Amazon. And you know, I've talked to a lot of friends that are still at Amazon and they're like, you know, should I leave and go to an early stage company? What's it like? It's kind of hard to leave the stock, I know, but um, but uh, I would make that decision a hundred times over. I mean, it's just uh, it's it's a it's a new way of learning because the things I took for granted now, it's my job to build them. So all of a sudden, you start realizing how hard it is, frankly, and um, and there's a lot of learning that comes with all of that. But yeah, so what it took. Um, well, I would say the thing I'm most proud of is uh, sort of leveraging core values as a strategic advantage. So Amazon has uh, core values, they're called leadership principles, there are 14 of them. And if you talk to any Amazonian ever, they can recite all of them from memory. There are things like insist on the highest standards, that be, think big, be right a lot. Um, and these were used, they were so deeply ingrained in the culture and the vernacular, I mean, this is the basis on which you hire, fire, and cook. So when you're interviewing your loop, your interview loop, you're signing out core values. Okay, you've got that deep, I'm gonna do think big. Um, so you're assessing people against these values before you bring them in, and then sort of when they're in, it's the basis for promotions, and you know, and, and you know, in the event that it's not working out, it's also the basis for letting folks go. Um, it's, the, it's just the language, it's like so infused, and you hear these words all the time, which is how it's so easy to remember them, because because um, you're speaking them when you do pure performance reviews, you're you know, writing the values that people uphold or maybe need to work on. So anyway, um, when I got to Ticketfly, we had values. I mean, they were written on some documents somewhere that it took me quite a while to find, actually. They're like, yeah, well, like, well, so what are the core values here? Because I, I was trying to hire. And I'm um, like, well, you know, what am I sort of hiring against? Like, I understand, like, have the right skills and marketing functional stuff I can do, but like, you know, what are the sort of values? And uh, yeah, I think. So there's a document about that somewhere, and, uh, and I'm like, okay, so I wrote it out, and it's like, you know, and there's some good things on there, but clearly, like, they're, you know, if they're on a document somewhere, you're not really leveraging them. So, the um, thing I'm most proud of is championing an initiative, which took a while um, to really bring to life, but to uh, redefine our values and, um, you know, uh, and sort of, uh, you know, use them in sort of the day to day at, at the company. Totally, and just to provide a little more context, so Christina is now joined Realty Shares at a similar um, time in, a, in our life and a, an inflection point in a company that's going from a startup to you know a big company that's 120 people big and now we need processes and now we need um, to know what our core values are and hire against them, right? Like as a startup, you're kind of just throwing things against the wall, hoping some good sticks, some good doesn't, iterating, testing quickly. So you know. So Christina's kind of helping us with that uh, process right now, and, it, and it's it's incredibly helpful. So so you were able to take a bunch of these learnings, create like process and structure and, and organization at at Ticketfly. Um, not everything worked, I would say. Like that was that was definitely <laughs> well, it's, it's a different company, a different culture. I'll tell you one thing that you're experiencing that um, didn't fit the culture of Ticket Fly as much. Like, why would that? Like, there's a lot of uh, you know the way we speak to our maybe, maybe explain what Ticket Fly is. Yeah, of course. Right. Well, no. I know. I like yeah. Okay, Ticket Fly is basically like Ticketmaster but nicer with better technology. <laughs> So, um, so uh, Ticketfly's clients are venues and promoters, and uh, and so uh, and the reason we choose Ticketfly is they have this great marketing platform. There are actually some folks um, here who uh, help make that even better. And so, um, and you know, the fans can come to Ticketfly and essentially buy tickets uh, from the venues that are using Ticketfly's technology. So, um, so anyway, it's kind of B two B to C, which as a marketer is really fun because our marketing is actually focused on both businesses and consumers, which is one of the reasons I chose it. I wasn't sure. Uh, I kind of felt like the two roads were diverging in the wood. Like I was either going to be a B2B or a B2C marketer, and I liked them both. I did both at Amazon, 
And uh, so Ticket Fly was kind of uh, basically they didn't have to choose. Uh, so still don't have to choose realty shares with both too. I know, so I can't let it go, yeah. Uh, so uh, but yeah, one of the things uh, that's kind of hard to so the Amazon's uh, you know, uh, leadership principle of dive deep, one of the ways that manifests itself is in these um, six papers, huh, or uh, very detailed, uh, like written documents. So there's no PowerPoints. No one in Amazon is ever presenting anything in PowerPoint. Um, somewhere along the line, I don't know if Jeff said this, but someone said like PowerPoint is a tool for weak minds. I totally disagree, by the way. I just want you to know that. Um, I actually think PowerPoint is a great communications tool. It can be. It can facilitate earlier discussion. However, um, at Amazon, that was not the tool that we used, um, and everything was kind of printed out in sort of Word document form. Uh, and what I did like about that, though, is like the depth of thinking and analysis that you go into when you're actually writing long form. It is, you know, it gives you sort of a space to go deeper. And uh, so meetings would begin with printing out essentially a copy of whatever you're doing. So you're investigating something, or maybe you're doing quarterly planning or whatever. Everyone on the table gets a printed copy, and you spend the first 15 minutes in silence reading through um, you know, the materials that have been presented. And then the balance of the time is spent discussing the material and frankly pushing, and Amazon kind of pushing on, I disagree, I think your assumption's flawed, you know, those sort of things, but it makes you better. And so as opposed to, I think, you know, the thing I like about it is like the discussion. I think also when you are presenting, you wind up consuming a lot of the airtime with like explaining your points and um, people can read faster than like someone can present. So you actually wind up using the time a little bit more efficiently. But I did an early effort to <laughs> introduce that um, sort of a ticket buy, and I'll say like, it's just like, we did a lot of presentations. Like that's how venues and promoters, that's how we were communicating our, you know, sort of story to them. And it, there was, uh, that was like a really important vehicle for us as a company. Um, that's, you know, it was kind of critical for all of our, uh, you know, sales conversations. And so it was, it was a place where actually PowerPoint was really valued, or not PowerPoint, presentations were valued. Um, and uh, so anyway, so there were, there were less one-pagers, and you, know, you sort of adapt to the tools that make most more sense for the culture. Yeah, yeah so I think um, it sounds like maybe that that one tool or that one, um, yeah, like print, printing out for meetings didn't work for Ticketfly, but a lot of things did. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some aha moments you had around habits or things that work really well at Ticketfly or, or just in general as a marketer? My biggest aha moment was when someone introduced me to the no feel do framework for planning your communications. So essentially it's before you start even drafting anything, a word, or your presentation, your email, whatever, like you have something important to communicate. Writing out what you want people to know, what you want your audience, who's your audience by the way, what you want them to know, how you want them to feel, and what you want them to do. And it sounds kind of perfunctory. It's not. I've seen firsthand the transformation that presentations that kind of feel like they're all over the place take. When you actually take a step back, you say, okay, oh, hold on, wait, wait. What do we want people to know? How do we want them to feel? What do we want them to do? And sure enough, you find out that some of the places where the presentation is going wayward is because we're not actually, we're not driving toward those things. And I found it significantly improved my own communications. I literally never give a presentation without writing my no feel do out first. It's also a great tool as a, you know, as, as a leader. So, um, you know, if my team is so like, you know, Haley, you write out no feel do. We did this for the, for this. So this is my first fireside chat for badass marketers and founders, and Christina helped me write out a, a no feel do for what I wanted to happen here tonight. Exactly, and so based on that, then we can say, okay, that's an agreed upon standard. Where that's what we're trying to shoot for. So then, if let's say you put something together for the forum that I felt didn't, like you were missing one of the no's, or maybe you was not very strong enough. Yeah. What the no feel do was. Yeah. Yeah. We just have to go back. We'll test you. <laughs> yeah. Tell me if it, if it works. So I wanted you to know that Josh created this enormous community. I wanted you to know that there's now a San Francisco-based community that I'm leading and that there's a Facebook group that I want you to join. Um, I want you to feel excited to be a part of this community and and um, yeah, and that it's local and that and, and that it's accessible. And then I wanted you to do, I wanted you to, first of all, I wanted you to like 
this experience. <laughs> I'm kind of used to um, you need to sign up for the San Francisco chapter. Yeah. Like, well, you to to sign up for the San Francisco chapter. Yeah, that was yeah. marketers and chapters. Yeah, that's the do. That's the do. I also have a blog called growthmarketingpro.com, and I'd love for you to subscribe. And I'm probably going to share a recording of this um, to everyone who is subscribed. So that was the do. So that helped me um, plan for tonight. So let's say that then I'd seen a little bit of what you were going to present, and I could say, hmm, I feel like. You know, it's like, I'm not sure that we're getting people excited enough here. Now, we've already agreed that part of the feel is that you're excited. So instead of Christina's subjective assessment that, like, people should be more excited, in fact, we're, it's just upholding the concept that we're creating to a concrete upon standard that we've all aligned on. And when you're planning really important communication, I actually find it's effective across your team to, before anyone does any work, just get a quick room and huddle on the no field do, because that avoids a lot of throwaway work, frankly. Like sometimes, you know, you see presentations that are like 50 slides, and I'm like, oh my god, like this is like a lot of content, and like I'm not even really sure exactly where this is going. Whereas if we had started with the no field do, we could have saved a lot of like, you know, superfluous slide creation. Yeah. So I did. It. I also did no field do for the presentation I gave just before the <laughs> before now, right? Like what I wanted the, the stakeholders to understand. I wanted them to feel, you know, a little concerned about this one issue we have, and I wanted them to feel motivated to solve it and feel like they were they were bought in to give me the support we needed to move forward. So another example. Um, maybe we should. See if the audience has any questions for you. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give you a mic.
sponsored content that looks just like the rest of their content. So that's another way you can kind of like create PR. Anyone else have questions? Hey, sorry, I'm having the hands posted. Hey. Um, what kind of companies life cycle do you suggest having a full time growth marketer? Yeah, uh, that's also that's a good one too. Because I think, to be honest, like probably the thing I've spent the most time talking to other marketers about is organizational design. Like, how do you design your team, and like, what roles do you hire first? And um, you know, it's it's definitely a, it's a challenge all marketers face. And depending on your business, like whether you're sort of B2B or B2C, I mean, there's like it'll take you in uh, kind of different directions there. I guess um, so. There's a lot of different models for uh, you know sort of company life cycle stage development. Um, you know, one that I sort of like is you've got the market validation phase, you've got the revenue phase. Like revenue is basically you're getting up to like you know 10 million revenue, you probably have around 100 people, and then you've got the scale phase. And so certainly as you're hitting the revenue phase, uh, growth marketers like that is the time to consider that um, you know assuming that that's the, the sort of right model for your business. Um, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of like growth marketing is kind of a, a term is like relatively nascent on the scene, but like what I love about it is like how action oriented it is. And uh, so, I mean, I guess what I'd say is as you're kind of like pivoting from the market for validation, like you already have a few enough customers to know that like there's something there that people want, and you're trying to really demonstrate and scale your revenue. Um, that's definitely the time to start thinking about it. Uh, oh, sorry, too loud now. Uh, following up with that, with your experience at Amazon and the two startups, when you're thinking about growth, what were the kind of key metrics that you were using and how did you determine those and when to change them to other key metrics in the growth uh, stages? Yeah, yeah that, that's a great question. So your metrics really, like depending on your business model, like the, it's really, uh, you know, I guess like I'm not sure there's any one size fits all. Um, so for instance, Ticketfly, I was honest when I joined Ticketfly, like knowing it was sort of B2B to C, I guess I thought that what I'd be spending a lot of my time focused on was consumer marketing, having been like my experience with live events at that point in time was mostly as a fan. And I thought, well, wow, like I'm missing out on so many shows, and like people should be telling me about these things because, like, I don't want to miss, you know, my favorite artist come to town. Um, but what I learned is based on Ticketfly's business model, which was very B2B to see, like we only have tickets to sell the fans if we acquire, you know, the venues and promoters behind those events. And so actually, it was really like the the kind of lion's share of our early efforts were really around kind of the B2B marketing, and it was a direct sales model there and I would say but really it's just it's just so so dependent because in Ticketfly's world the universe of venues is known. It's not like we're you know there's like hundreds of thousands of venues, there's you know like ten thousand venues that you might potentially want to fire and they're all in our Salesforce database. And it's really just a matter of when they're contracting with Ticketmasters up so you know we can go and uh, you know try to uh, bring their business over to uh, the better platform. Um, so I guess what I'd say is there, you know, there's a lot of focus on win rate, a lot of focus on, you know, sort of B2B sales enablement, like a lot of our efforts were spent there, but that was sort of a function of our business and sort of where it was at. So whereas even if you were a B2B platform, let's say, but, you know, instead of 10,000 sort of known prospects, you had hundreds of thousands of potential prospects for your global, let's say, you know, then you probably are spending a little bit more time thinking about demand generation and things like that and bringing people, you know, sort of through your funnel and, you know, can people just sign up? or do they have to have a sales conversation and sort of, so I guess what I'd say is I just don't know that there's any one size fits all model, but I will say that, you know, Ticketfly, as we started to scale the business, all of a sudden we had enough consumers that it did start to make sense to market to them. So really for our business model, the kind of pivot was that we started hiring more consumer marketers and actually built out a consumer marketing team and spent more time helping our venues and promoters market to them. Uh, I want to ask, what are the different modes of, of marketing that you actually apply with Ticketfly to reach out to more customers, to reach out to more clients? So, something which you learned from Amazon and which was different in Ticketfly, different ways to reach out to people. 
Yeah, so for ticket fly, this is the, the one thing I'll say, and it's kind of again unique to sort of the business model. Like a lot of our time was spent not so much reaching more customers, but how do we more effectively tell our story. So we had the relationships for the most part. I mean, that's not to say we, now when we enter new markets for sure, then, there, then there's more demand generation, it's more about reach, and you know, it's finding basically the places where they're, um, you know, the, the decision makers are spending their time and trying to reach out to them. So that was a bit of a shift, but you know, our kind of core was in this, uh, you know, music uh, and you know, promoter space. And you know, again, it's like we knew who those people were. It was really a matter of uh, convincing them that um, Ticketify would be a great platform. So, but there I would say, I mean, I've never spent more time on sales enablement. And I guess that what one learning I can share is I realized after a few years of thinking about it, like I partnered with many sales teams before, but it occurred to me I spent so much time reading about marketing. I mean, literally, you know, it's like, I mean, Seth goes just like a hero to me. I literally read like every single email that he sends. Um, you know, taking his class, like reading marketing books. I mean, I've got the Bible on me. I'm so proud of my marketing books. It's the canon in my house and like the whole thing. And up until, frankly, about a year and a half ago, I'd never read a single book about sales. Not one. I mean, I'd worked with sales leaders and tried to understand their sales process so we could work as, you know, enablers. But I fundamentally, they're like, there's like foundational frameworks around sales that I, it was almost like an aha, you know, around stakeholder identification, sort of the sales process. And, um, and so I guess, uh, I mean, the recommendation I would say, given the, the model that we had or something, I learned at Ticket5 was just, if you're going to enable sales, you need to understand a fair amount about sales. And if you have a great sales partner, you guys are working in very close partnership. Uh, so it's not so much just that, like, you know, marketing is taking orders, but you're actually collaborating on a strategy uh, that sort of maps to the, both the sales team strategic approach as well as, um, you know, our marketing business. Well, on, on, I have a question about that question. Like, um, that's kind of like the B2B side of the business. I'm curious to know what the consumer side of the business, like what channel the consumer side is using. Yeah, so consumer side. So typically you do a lot of paid marketing. Um, when I say a lot of that's pretty much like not very much at all to the point of like a very small budget every now and then we would test something but um, it was really more focused on sort of uh, organic marketing to our existing base and the reason for that kind of goes back again to the business model so we're B2B to C so the reason to choose Ticketfly is that it actually is a platform for marketing your events so the venues and promoters we are a tool for the marketers at their you know marketers of these businesses to market their shows so actually the focus of our, a lot of our consumer marketers was around how we help our partners get more leverage out of our tools because that actually helped sell more tickets. So we actually brought in um, some uh, great leadership uh, that's sitting with us here today that uh, actually is, you know, sort of almost a marketing consultancy to sit there and, you know, sit with our partners and make sure that they were getting the most leverage out of our tool sets, which included things like, um, you know, we had an email tool and an automated social publishing tool. Uh, we had affiliate program and things like that. And there are, think there are actions that our partners could take that would help them get more value out of Ticketfy. Uh, and our incentives were aligned. So essentially, like this is one of my favorite things about Ticketfly's business model. So when <laughs> more tickets are sold, both Ticketfly and the venues and promoters make more money. Uh, so I mean, we were very much partners in that regard. Uh, but the tool itself, in fact, was a platform. So there was a pretty heavy B2B focus on it. That's cool. So like your B2B partners helped you acquire more B2C exactly. partners. But and at some point, then we gained enough critical mass. So I guess one of the things we did spend a fair amount of time thinking about was like sort of our regional, um, you know, event curation. So that was a big thing that we started doing. Is you know, we actually, by virtue of you know, starting to gain more market share in certain local markets, you know, call it Denver, New York, other places, we actually had some of the hippest, coolest clubs. And um, like Brooklyn Bulls, Burning Man, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, in New York, you know, it's a park summer stage. Uh, yeah, Brooklyn Bowl, uh, Bowery Ballroom. Like you've got, you know, like some of like basically some of the greatest places where uh, events are happening are on Ticketfly. So when we had enough critical mass in a market, we spent time. We acquired these customers by virtue of the fact that you know our partners had sold tickets, and then we essentially remarketed to them through um, sort of curated event recommendations and a couple of more you know sort of personalized tools that then we opened up. Um, but yeah. yeah, so you were able to build your email list that way with the help of your partner. And it was only after we'd acquired enough because if you only have one venue in the city, you don't really have like if you're 
recommending events, like you're basically just effectively re you're redundant with that venue's marketing team. So you sort of need enough of a critical mass within. But I would say that you know part of that then uh, I suppose like you know there were a lot of learnings around you know kind of locational marketing and like when do you have enough critical mass and um, you know how do you build sort of like uh, you know connections in, in community within a specific region you know regional area. Um, Hi, so now my question is, what is your take on social media and basically converting the social following, uh, whether that's just engagement, because I'm on social media, and it's really powerful. My question is, how do marketers and founders and company leaders turn that social following into conversion, real dollars, and you know, engagement up and up? Yeah, so social has definitely evolved a lot. Like it's become way, way more pay to play. Uh, you know, so the like organic reach, um, you know, is, is probably not getting you there. Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, certainly like well, Facebook's the primary platform I guess it has the most experience with, but certainly Facebook's innovating a lot in the space, and there are, um, you know, sort of uh, more tools that facilitate conversion, and you know, you have. Uh, sort of, you know, lead ads and other things like that that can kind of help marketers, um, frankly, get a higher ROI. And I think all of those things, you know, are worth testing. Um, I think a lot of the tools around, you know, custom audience building, I mean, that's kind of a, it, it, it's just a neat way to, like, reach your own audience in a different place. And you've got all their email addresses, and it's like, oh, right, now I can reach them on Facebook, so you have multiple touch points with your audience. I think those are things that are really worth testing. Lookalike audiences can also work very well, so, like, audiences that look like your best customers, and you can start small, like take your very, very best customers. You don't have to do lookalike audiences against like everyone, anyone who's ever purchased your, um, you know, offering before. You can start with like your best, and, you know, kind of like, um, I guess the, you know, the best guidance is the more that you can step into things and take, you know, sort of, uh, me you know, measured bets. So, um, you know, I think a lot of times we feel like we have to have massive budgets for testing, but there's actually ways to test things that are pretty lightweight. I guess as far as my perspective on social media though, like I, I think that, you know, I, I guess it, I, I think a lot of folks, especially not marketing, think of it as a marketing tool. Like it's like, oh, we have to go and talk to our folks and let them know, you know, our, our followers and then reach more people and tell them all about what we're about. And that is in fact you know, a, a use case. Um, I think it's an even better tool for listening, especially if you have the type of business model where there are influencers who are, you know, speaking about, uh, you know, sort of your space. If you're a product that defines a category, for instance, like realty shares, you need to find online real estate investments when people are talking about it. We want them to be talking about us, and we want the people who are having conversations like, you know, thought leaders like Financial Samurai. We want Financial Samurai to be talking about us, and we should be following Financial Samurai. I know it's interesting to Financial Samurai, and so it's a lot of, you know, I guess it's, it, it, great social media uh, strategies have a balance of listening and speaking, and there's a lot you can do with influencers, and you can actually target them. I have a question about, um, so like one of our primary customer acquisition channels is just, it's like kind of reaching a, a diminished in returns and it's not as effective as it used to be. Uh, and I kind of like the internal struggle between, is it a channel or like, are we just being sloppy in our utilization of the channel, like messaging mechanisms, et cetera? Or like, should we just be switching to something else? Like, so should we optimize the channel that we're using that's kind of diminishing, or should we change, like, change or test some other channels? Um, and then, kind of like a two-part question: if, if we were to, you know, start testing a bunch of other channels, um, how do you personally prioritize, like, which acquisition channels are you going to test? I think if you, I think that, like any channel, if you have sufficient budget, again, I don't think you need much, but like any channel you can possibly envision is worth testing. Is once you have a, an idea of what the ROI will be, then you can ask yourself, if I have a, a dollar to spend, or let's say if I have a hundred dollars to spend, what's the most cost-effective channel? So it's like the, you know, sort of, like the marginal return that I get on this dollar, if I have an incremental dollar to spend, I want to spend it in the highest return channel. And so, if you don't test enough channels, you won't necessarily know what that channel is. And so, like a lot of times, you know, I think it's kind of easy to be like, oh, we have, you know, ten thousand dollars, and I'm gonna, you know, equally allocate them across the channels, and you know, we'll sort of then try to optimize. But actually, if you, if one channel, if you can get more juice, if you can spend all ten thousand dollars on your highest performing channel, then like, there's no reason not to do that. I mean, that's the, you know, the economic optimization sort of answer to that 
uh, you know, a problem um, or opportunity. Um, oftentimes, some, you know, within channels, you can get more narrow on the, the targeting. So, uh, you know, and that will sort of help your ROI economics as well. But there is, I mean, with pretty much every channel, at some point you, you do run out of, like, there's only so much optimization you can squeeze out of it. And then you kind of topped out, and this is like a challenge that a lot of folks face. You can also think about how the channels interplay with one another. I mean, the forever, you know, multi, uh, your attribution strategy. Yeah, exactly. So that also kind of adds complexity things, because it's not as if most people are touching just one channel. And I would say that, like, uh, I am still a student of the optimal attribution methodology, because, you know, we've looked at very different worlds even for, it's like, if you look at first touch, you look at, you know, time decay, you look at last touch, and you actually look at your acquisition across channels with, like, very different stories. And for some, you know, some it's broken even, you know, sort of you get like kind of the same answer out of like, the, or the channels, you know, look kind of equally performant across. And in other cases, like your attribution logic is going to dramatically influence like your perceived ROI. Yeah, if anyone's an attribution expert, Christina and I want to talk to you. Yes, we'd love to talk to you. <laughs> um, so I think we have time for like one or two more. Christina and Marco, I have a question that piggybacks with what we heard earlier. Like when you're in that revenue stage, a couple millions, ten million revenue a year, where I'm finding my company in, and we're looking now to bring on somebody as a work marketer or use that acquisition full time. Um, how do you go about building that team? How do you find that first key hire, the second key hire to build that team? What's your strategy on that? Because I'm looking right now and I want to think you're great exactly. I guess there are different ways to, to do this. Like, you know, some companies will say, well, you know, we'll do like a contract to hire. Like, let's have someone prove their salt. And if they're a really great, you know, growth marketer, then, you know, sort of like that. And then they, you know, hire them full time. Um, that's like a lot of folks uh, do that. Um, I think that's reasonable. You know, I guess the question I've had is, you know, it's, that there's there's definitely a universe of growth marketers who are outstanding who are willing to work on a you know sort of like temporary let's see how things work out basis and there's also a lot of folks that would like something more stable so I do think that if you have a vision that you know there's a bigger growth story for your company starting your first hire as someone who's more senior and strategic so as opposed to like someone that's just kind of walking and tackling and maybe where this is the first rodeo but actually bringing in like it will be a more expensive hire but bringing in someone who can build a team you're just you're better served like the person who kind of like has learned the ropes has made some of the mistakes and frankly like and can find the, the opportunities and sort of build the business case around how the team should grow um, so I, I guess that's uh, you know sort of thinking about like the leveling um, but uh, yeah, it's like it's kind of you know different companies uh, approach things different ways. Yeah, I think for sure, like someone someone with, the, with leadership as a as a first hire, and then I mean, so we we at Realty Shares we had Mark, and he had that experience and that leadership. He hired me as the second marketing person, and I think that the the second person can be like someone who's a, kind of a generalist, and can, you know, especially if you're at a startup, you can do a lot. A lot of things, um, test a lot of things, um, and then and then I think as you grow and scale, you hire more like special, people for specialized roles. So someone for SEM, someone for you know paid acquisition. Like I think that's like the because um, your your first hire, like you want someone who's willing to roll up their sleeves. Obviously, that's one of the things you would test for. Like not someone who's like, oh, I'm so senior. Like I'm gonna have people, you know, uh, sort of you know on, on my team. Like you also want someone who like like to grow into that. But you know the, the rolling up sleeves. Is important, but the, the strategic folks are already going to know how to approach the problem. Like, again, if I have $100 to spend, or I have an hour of my time to spend, what's the highest return in place for me to invest this time? And then they can start kind of proving out the numbers, and all of a sudden you can see where the juice is. And uh, so that's like a, another benefit you get from like hiring someone who's kind of like seen the rodeo before. Cherry, <laughs> probably. Um, okay, well. Thanks for um, your questions, and, and we're going to hang out afterwards to, to chat further. But before we close out, um, I think that there's some incredible like entrepreneurial people in this room, and I bet a lot of us have ideas for what we think might be the next best business, and then it might be something we're working on, or it might be something we're working on the side, or it might be just an idea we've had in our head for a really long time about something we think could be the next best thing. Um, what advice would you give us around, um, what advice would you, would you leave us with? 
Yeah, so finding the next best thing. Well, I guess the, I, I, I have advice on finding the next best thing and then advice on like what to do once you found it. So finding the next best thing. Well, this is not from me. This is something from uh, Jeff Bezos that kind of stuck with me. Um, but you know, he talks a lot about how often entrepreneurs are trying to understand the changing landscape. And things are changing all the time, very fast. The technology is progressing, and there's new market opportunities opening up to us all the time. And so entrepreneurs, you know, are often sort of like, you know, there's a constantly surveying landscape, and they get a finger on the pulse of sort of, you know, the changing winds, and try to point their business. Uh, idea sort of in the direction of you know of the winds, and um, so you know, and often that's based on an assessment of you know what's changing in the next one to ten years. And what Jeff Bezos would say is the better question to ask is what's not changing in the next ten years, and to build a business around that. So Amazon's promise, like the, the core, like the sort of strategy of Amazon is selection, availability, and price, and there's just no world in which consumers are not going to want the greatest possible selection, anything they'd want to discover instantly on demand at the best price that's out there. And so that was, uh, but you know, the thinking there was not just around, yes, e-commerce was sort of a new way of delivering products to, to consumers and allowing consumers to, to make those purchases, but the core strategy of the business was something that's kind of fundamental to humanity, that there, were, there wasn't any expectation to change, certainly not in the next 10 years, if ever. That's really cool. And then once you have a great idea, like get some strong marketers in to help you make it, like realize your vision. Yeah, find the right customers. It's half the challenge too. Like for any of these things, it's like making sure you're actually targeting the right customer and that you understand the right way to speak, the right way to reach them, the right way to speak to them, and that you're kind of building a brand that means something and that really impacts people's lives. Thank you so much.